Hello everybody. It is my third lecture of the module 6. Uh, that is with this lecture I will complete this module, 6th module and the 6th week lectures. So in this lecture I was intending to deliver some special topics on the transverse vibration of the beam. So far we are discussing about the free vibration and force vibration of the beam but there are some special topics that sometimes require some attention to modify the formulation to suit the purpose of the analysis. For example, a beam resting on the elastic foundation or a beam uh, carrying an axial load or even a beam of infinite domain. So such problems require different techniques or slightly different arrangement of the equations to obtain the answers. So we will discuss today the three topics. One is vibration of the beam on elastic foundation and second one is the axial force effect that means suppose a beam is there it is simply supported or supported in any other manner but in addition to that axial load is also present. So in that case we will investigate how the vibration frequencies will be affected by the axial force. So that formulation I want to do and demonstrate with an example of simply supported beam. Then the vibration problem of beam with infinite length. Now there are certain problems say for example uh, road pavement it is stressing kilometers and kilometers so if you want to model the road pavement as a beam resting on the elastic foundation the boundaries are not known but it is obvious that under the wheel load the pavement will deflect that means your beam model will show the deflection under the wheel load and this deflection of course will be gradually diminishing and will vanish towards very infinite extent. That means the effect of loading on the infinite beam is only felt at a certain distance but at a large distance away from the application of the load that effect will not be felt or visible. So that is also in one sense it is a St. Bannon principle that we know in stress analysis but here the beam is of infinite length that means if you consider a railroad track or even a pavement and model it by a beam then you will be able to model with infinite domain provided you alter the formulation technique. The formulation technique so that we have uh, adopted is the mode superposition technique where you require to know the natural frequencies and mode shape. But for infinite beam there is no such mode shapes of the beam that you can find out from this uh, model analysis. So therefore here the different techniques have to be adopted. So that I will discuss here in the third topic vibration problem of beam with infinite length and they have practical applications. Okay. Now let us consider the vibration of beam on elastic foundation. Consider a beam here you can see this beam I have taken and it may be supported by any manner and it is supported continuously over the closed space springs that you are seeing here and that spring behavior I have taken as a linear behavior so that the force in the spring is proportional to the displacement of the beam. So therefore here you can see due to load application whatever manner it is the beam will deflect as a result of this deflection the 
spring will be compressed and it will offer a upward resistance to the beam. Now you can see that effective load on the beam will be reduced due to spring force. So the equation of motion can be modified as this is the term which is due to beam elasticity or beam fractural stiffness Ei del 4 y by del x4 that is actually the term which is related to the distributed force in static analysis plus m del square y by del t square this is the inertia force you can easily see per meter per unit length of the beam and of course here we have neglected the damping if one considers the damping then additional term c into del y by del t that is c is the damping coefficient per unit length and del y by del t is the velocity should be added here okay but here i neglected damping now the the distributed force that is appearing on the right hand side will be reduced by the spring reaction so that is distributed force is now written as f x t minus k y x t okay so equation of motion now becomes e i del 4 y by del x 4 plus m del square y by del t square plus k y x t equal to f x t here k is a parameter which is here you are seeing that it is a spring constant but in, in real practice when the beam is resting on the elastic subgrade for example a pavement when it is resting on the elastic subgrade then the k represents modulus of subgrade reaction modulus of subgrade reaction okay now similar thing happens when you find a rail, a railway track. Suppose this is a longitudinal section of a lane, uh, rail which is of I section. Okay. It is resting on the ballast through sleeper, closely spaced sleeper. So then ballast material are there, this is the ballast material, this is rail and this is your sleeper, and this material is the ballast called ballast. So here this is these are the examples of beams in the uh, on the elastic foundation so ballast here acts as the elastic foundation similarly here the road pavement a portion of the road pavement that is shown here will act as a, a beam resting on the elastic pavement now instead of spring stiffness now here the k will represents the modulus of subgrade reaction modulus of subgrade reaction that is ballast is acting as a subgrade which offers a reaction upwards to the deflection of the beam so the model is same so therefore this is the model of the beam on elastic foundation the extra term that you are seeing here ky xt is due to the elastic subgrade the properties of the elastic subgrade and k y x t is nothing but you can call it subgrade reaction subgrade reaction per unit length okay so with this model that is differential equation now let us proceed to find out the natural frequency and then force vibration analysis if the force is present okay now for natural frequency we have to find the 
mode shapes and corresponding eigenvalues when the external force is not present. So therefore, we have taken fxt is 0 and this is the equation. Now, for free vibration, we assume that motion is harmonic and therefore, we assume that the y displacement of the beam is like that phi x into sin omega t where omega is the natural frequency of the beam. Now, since there is no damping, so no phase angle is associated with this. So, normal mode uh, vibration takes place at frequency omega and you will find like uh, any other continuous system, infinite number of omega is possible and infinite number of natural frequencies are also possible. So, here after substituting this, let us substitute in differential equation. What is differential equation? E i del 4 y del x 4 plus m del square y by del t square and in, instead of damping, damping force is 0. So, that damping term is not coming equal to 0. Okay. So, after substituting of course, very important parameter k y should appear here because this is the upward reaction of the spring. So, after substituting this we are now getting here E i because now after separation of variable we are getting the ordinary differential equation. So, E i d to the power 4 into phi divided by d x 4 that is the fourth derivative of phi minus m omega square phi x plus k phi x equal to 0. So, uh, separating this term first let us divide it by E i. So, after dividing by E i we are getting del 4 phi by del x 4 minus bracket m omega square by E i minus k by E i phi x. So, this term can be taken as lambda to the power 4 as usual. Therefore, differential equation now becomes equal to 0. And if I assume that uh, characteristic uh, equation that is solution of the homogeneous equation that means uh, that is our phi, phi is nothing but e to the power say beta x then after substituting this you will get beta 4 minus lambda 4 equal to 0. That means after factorization you will get beta square lambda square beta square minus lambda square beta square plus lambda square into beta square minus lambda square equal to 0. So, then it yields the root beta is equal to plus lambda minus lambda plus i lambda minus i lambda. So, this is the root beta that we get. Therefore, the solution can be written now uh, in this fashion that uh, and then constant of integration can be found out. So, solution can be now written as phi is equal to phi is equal to say some constant c1 e to the power beta x l lambda x plus c2 e to the power minus lambda x plus c3 e to the power i lambda x plus c4 e to the power minus i lambda x. Now, remembering that e to the power lambda x or e to the power minus lambda x can be written expressed in terms of sin hyperbolic and cos hyperbolic function. Similarly, this i lambda x e to the power i lambda x or e to the power minus i lambda x can be written as a cosine and sine function. So, therefore, the solution now we obtain as phi x equal to a 1 cos hyperbolic lambda x plus a 2 sin hyperbolic lambda x plus a 3 cos lambda x plus a 4 sin lambda x. 
Now here you can see that as usual we have got the fourth order uh, solution of the fourth order homogeneous equation for the beam eigenvalue problem earlier. Here also we are getting uh, similar solution but lambda here is changed. So lambda to the power 4 here is m omega square divided by ei minus k divided by ei. So to get the omega square at any mode now we get say if I transfer this k by ei on the right hand side then I can write lambda to the power 4 plus k ei that means from this equation let us first find this omega square. So ei I can write it lambda to the power 4 k by ei then omega square will be obviously lambda to the power 4 ei by m and here k by m term will come. So this is what is natural frequency. So <coughs> after imposing the boundary condition you will get a homogeneous uh, equation that you must solve for uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So after application of boundary condition after application of BC. BC represents boundary condition you will get a equation set of equation which will be a matrix of containing this uh, the function of lambda L and this matrix will be 4 by 4 multiplied by this vector a1, a2, a4 equal to 0. Okay. So for non-trivial solution trivial solution one has to obtain the determinant of this this matrix contain the terms which are functions of lambda L. So every element of this matrix will contain some term which will be function of lambda L. So this determinant is equated to 0 so that expanding the determinant expand determinant and get characteristic equation. Similar to that we have observed or we have found in beams where there was no elastic support throughout the length. Okay. Now let us take the case of a simply supported beam. Now in simply supported beam the transcendental equation that you obtain equation for finding the eigenvalues that you obtain is sin lambda L equal to 0. So that gives lambda L equal to n pi where n varies from 1 to up to infinity. So the nth natural frequency or nth frequency parameter lambda n will be n pi by L. Therefore the omega n square that is the natural frequency square that we have obtained earlier is this. Now here you can put the value of lambda n. Lambda n is equal to n pi by L. So after putting this value we now get the omega the natural frequency here where omega n is the nth natural frequency. nth natural frequency is equal to n square pi square divided by root over ei by m into 1 plus k l to the power 4 divided by n to the power 4 pi to the power 4 ei. Now you can see the second term here is the contribution due to elastic subgrade. So the presence of elastic subgrade as it appears from this equation 
will increase the natural frequency as compared to beam which is not supported over the elastic foundation because the support will increase the rigidity of the beam, stiffness of the beam, naturally the energy of the elastic subgrade will be added. So therefore the elastic subgrade will contribute to more frequency of the beam. So you can see from here that due to presence of K the natural frequency will increase. But if somebody ignore the value of K then natural frequency will be same as simply supported beam. Now another important thing you can notice here that if the number of mode number increases here the natural frequency will increase because n square factor is there whereas in this expression you can find that n to the power 4 factor is also there. So because of this n to the power 4 factor the natural frequency may reduce in the higher mode. So let us now after obtaining the natural frequency in mode shape we can now analyze it for force vibration response. So force vibration response the equation of the force vibration is in presence of damping let us see is equal to C dy dt plus here the inertia term will come but in addition to that the elastic subgrade the spring reaction ky has to be there equal to fxt fxt is the externally applied force okay now this is what is lambda to the power 4 and uh, therefore we get this equation that earlier we know how we got the decoupled equation there are procedure that procedure you have to first you have to follow so first step is put y x t equal to summation of phi i x eta i t in this equation. So you can put this in this equation ok. After that multiply both side by a mode function phi j x and then utilize certain relations. So this relation you utilize there as well as the mass proportional damping that is C by M can be assumed as 2 j i i into omega i where j i i is the model damping ratio and omega i is the uh, ith natural frequency. So if I utilize this and use orthogonality condition orthogonality of the mode. So what is this orthogonality of the mode is m phi j x phi i x dx equal to 0 integration 0 to L. So if I use this then we get a decoupled equation of motion eta i double dot t plus 2 j i i. J i i is the model damping in many analysis the model damping is assumed same in all modes but if somebody experimentally find damping after exciting beam in a particular frequency or after getting the frequency response curve where the different modes are identified then it will be seen that as the number of modes increases damping value also increases. So therefore eta i t eta i double dot t plus 2 j i i omega i eta i dot t plus omega i square eta i t equal to q i t. You can note here that eta i double dot t is the acceleration and therefore the right hand side q i t should be in the acceleration unit. But here q i t is a generalized force that I uh, explained to you 
and generalized force is QIT equal to this FXT phi j x dx 0 to L. However, since we have normalized the mode shape with respect to mass such a way that this integral is 1 when i equal to j then you will get the normalized uh, that is the model mass is 1. So therefore in the QIT the it is actually actually the force divided by unit mass. So therefore this is also an acceleration unit. Now this is nothing but an equation of single degree freedom dynamic system which is also damped but here the frequency etc represents the modal frequencies and eta i t is the generalized coordinate it is not the physical response eta i t is the generalized coordinate of the system once you get the eta i then the generalized coordinate or actual physical response at any location of the beam can be found after the mode superposition so mode superposition is nothing but y x t equal to phi 1 x into eta 1 plus phi 2 into eta 2 plus phi 3 into eta 3 like that. So number of summation or number of modes for summation can be taken as per requirement for more accuracy of the displacement or for accurate results in displacement only few modes are sufficient but if one goes for bending moment and shear force then higher number of modes should be taken into consideration ok. Now after getting this solution of this and you can see this part is free vibration solution and free vibration solution you can easily understand it e to the power minus j i i omega i t into a i cos omega i t plus b i sin omega i t plus the force respond h i t minus tau into q i tau d tau. So that is the generalized force may contain your the characteristics of the force. If it is a sinusoidally applied force then this represents the steady state response for the, the sinusoidally applied force. So here you can see that due to this part a transient state will occur initially because of existence of initial condition and transient state will die out soon or later depending on the amount of damping and then you can see this the characteristics of the driving frequency in your response. So once you find this generalized coordinate of the response then the actual response of the beam can be calculated as y x t equal to phi i x eta i t and mode summation may be 1 to infinity ok. So this formulation is not restricted to only simply supported beam for any kind of support you can use this formulation this uh, mode separation technique that is uh, you can call it the decoupling technique using the model superposition and then use the formulation or use the known expression for this free vibration and force vibration for certain prescribed this forcing function like harmonic forcing function, step function etc. Now next let us go to a uh, topic where the axial force on the beam is present. So here you can take a beam for example a beam is taken. Uh, where I have considered the mass of the beam as m per unit length and Ei is the flexural rigidity of the beam per unit length. But remember that this m and Ei may be also a function of x but for simplicity I have taken m and Ei as the constant or uniform throughout the length of the beam and Fxt is the distributed load acting over the beam. So let us first derive the equation. 
okay that is because this equation will contain some additional term and how this term comes or how this term appears that let us investigate so first task is derive the equation of motion so equation of motion you can know there are different ways of uh, uh, derivation one is by hamilton principle another is for another is by newton second law so anyone you can adopt now let us use here hamilton principle so this is what is hamilton equation and hamilton equation you know that it is written as the variation of kinetic kinetic energy t t is the kinetic energy of the beam and u star i have taken as the summation of u1 plus u2 u1 is the strain energy due to bending due to bending and u2 is nothing but the work done due to due to axial force p so that two will merge and will give the u star whereas w and c is the non conservative portion and non conservative portion includes the forcing function as well as the damping force but here i am not considering the any damping here for the time being so let us uh, derive this equation here you can see a free body diagram of this element of length dx is shown here at a distance x now in the free body diagram this is the fxt and if at this point dx is the length of the beam and ds ds if i take it is the curved length it is the curved length okay so here you can see that uh, here this um, q is the shear force here and there the increment of shear will be q plus del q by del x into dx now here bending moment is m and at this portion the increment of bending moment is m plus del m by del x into dx here the axial force is p and there the axial force with increment will appear as p plus del p by del x into dx so all the quantities with their differential change i have expressed here in the free body diagram so one can also write the newton's law by taking the summation of moment equal to zero and also by taking the summation of algebraic force in the uh, y direction is equal to the inertia force because the motion will take place vertically along the y direction so therefore the inertia force will act along the y so if the direction is x and if direction is y so inertia force if the vertical motion is prescribed by the upward coordinate then inertia force will be acting opposite to that okay so this is the hamilton equation that i have considered you i have shown here and considered in the formulation and let us first find let us find all the variation delta t delta u star delta nc and then perform their time integration and then merge it we will be able to get the equation of motion as well as boundary condition okay now here first the kinetic energy of the beam is t equal to half uh, this integral m x m here i have uh, written as a function of x but you can treat is treat it as a constant for the formulation into del y by del t is the velocity so velocity square and integrated over the length okay strain energy due to bending u1 equal to half 0 to l this is the integration so u1 is half half factor will be there 0 to l ei del square y by del x square into dx 
Now let us find the U2 which is newly introduced here because of axial force. Okay. To calculate U2 we have the axial force P and multiplied by the the deformation that uh, axial deformation that is caused by the uh, force P. Okay. Now d lambda is the axial deformation it is nothing but ds minus dx okay now you can see if i consider a small element then this can be considered as a right angle rectangle okay so in that case using the pythagoras theorem we can write ds square is equal to dy square plus dx square so therefore ds can be written as after taking dx as common we can write 1 plus del y by del x whole square dx okay then this quantity can be expanded using binomial theorem 1 plus del y by del x square half dx using binomial theorem binomial theorem you expand this quantity inside the bracket and use only first two terms 1 plus half del y by del x first two term and neglect the higher order terms into dx that is ds so therefore d lambda is ds minus dx is nothing but half dy by dx whole square whole square into dx so we get this term so therefore the u2 is nothing but this u2 is now coming that uh, p into d lambda so this half term is coming so how the uh, factor half is coming because of this ch change in length it is not the average force that we have taken as earlier or in other case of computing the strain energy we take if the force varies from 0 to p and gives a triangular load deformation curve then we take p by 2 into delta but it is not due to this fact it is due to that change in length that is found after binomial expansion ignoring the higher order term this half factor is coming. So u2 is equal to half integration 0 to l p x p x t here p x t is taken variable but if p is constant if p is constant then we can take u2 is equal to p by 2 0 to l del y by del x whole square dx ok. So all the quantities are now obtained and this uh, non-conservative warp done that is nothing but due to externally applied load fxt into y xt dx 0 to l. Now we have to calculate the variation and its time integral ok. So first the variation of kinetic energy is taken. So variation of kinetic energy you can see the kinetic energy term was t is equal to half del y by del t whole square dx 0 to l. Now if I carry out the variation first let us take the variation. So variation is taken and variation you can see that half factor will go and 0 to l will come del y by del t and again del by del t into del y. So this term will come. Now you can see this is one function of time again this is also a function of time. So the integration by parts is applied here and therefore we get this the del t dt limit t1 to t2 is time integral will remain as it is 0 to l m del y by del t into del y this limit t1 to t2 will be there because if we now carry out this integral 
T1 to TT, T2. So, this is what is here. So, first part, this is the second part, ok. So, first function, this is second function. So, M del Y by del T del Y. So, this lower limit and upper limit are put minus M derivative of the first function. So, del square Y by del T square and del Y dt dx ok. And this will be 0 because you know that del Y the variation the varied path and uh, this actual path coincides at T1 and T2. So, therefore, del Y will be 0 at t is equal to t1 and t is equal to t2 as a result this term will vanish. So, u star now let us calculate u1 plus u2 and del u1 t because the strain energy is now due to bending is half 0 to l e i del square y by del x square whole square dx after carrying out this variation, we get this simply this E i del square y by del x square and del square by dx square into del y and integral 0 to L dx. So, carrying out this time integral of this variation, now we are getting this the time integral is t1 to t2 and then 0 to l e i del square y by del x square into del square by del x square into del y dx dt and after carrying out integration we will get the boundary terms e i del square y by del x square del by del x del y 0 to l minus e i del cube y by del x cube into del y 0 to l plus e i del to the power 4 y by del x to the power 4 del y del x and whole thing is integrated with respect to time. So, we have kept this in bracket and time integral is carried out with limit t1 and t2 ok. So, this uh, the u2 the variation of u2 now can be easily seen. So, variation of u2 uh, can be seen here p into del y by del x into variation of del y by del x dx dt and again this operator can be interchanged. So, we can write del by del x this can be written as for convenience del by del x into del y ok. So, now the the time integration can be carried out and uh, this uh, here we take one this as the first function and this is the second function ok. So, here in this uh, step second step it is written like that. So, p into del y by del x into del by del x del y dx by d, dx into dt. So, carrying out this time integration because we take this as the first function this is the second function. So, p into del y by del x and p here we take common ok a constant. So, we take p x t is p that is not varying with time or space. So, therefore, we take p here is a constant and del y del x and in integration is del y and limit 0 to l is put minus 0 to l p x t uh, derivative of the first function del square y by del x square del y delta y dx ok. So, we get the variation of all the quantities. Now, we can also find the variation of non-conservative force uh, term and this is uh, delta w n c d t t 1 t 2 equal to integration t 1 t 2 f x t del y d x. So, using the Hamilton's equation here and uh, adding all the terms that we individually obtain for integration of delta t for integration of uh, delta u star for the integration of w n c d t delta u star means 
delta u1 plus delta u2. So all these things are now again integrated and we are getting here ultimately this uh, the space integral 0 to L bracket m del y del t del y t1 t2 minus t1 integration uh, with limit t1 to t2 m del square y by del t square del y dx minus t1 to t2 then uh, bracket ei del cube y by del x cube into del y uh, its uh, value evaluated at 0 and l that is at the boundaries plus ei del square y by del x square into del by del x into del y 0 to l plus p del y by del x into del y 0 to l then this then this term uh, these are the boundary terms you can easily recognize it then the term which will go to differential equation are ei del to the power 4 y by del x 4 minus p del square y by del x square minus f x t of course from this uh, portion another term will be added here so after arranging all the boundary terms and the terms with the differential coefficients not evaluated at the boundary so we are now getting this one expression is like that this double integration t1 to t2 0 to l then ei del 4 y by del x 4 plus m del square y by del t square minus p del square y by del x square minus f x t bracket closed del y del x again bracket closed and then integrated with respect to time and these are the boundary terms that you can all recognize that it is nothing but shear ei del cube y by del x cube and this is nothing but the variation of the displacement and you can see here this is the term which is bending moment ei del square y by del x square and this is the term which can be related to the variation of the slope so all the quantities and this is actually you can see p del y by del x del y by del x is the slope which is nothing but tan theta and also if theta is small then you can see this is nothing but sin theta for example in this beam the p is acting here and this is your theta okay so theta here means del y by del x and it is nothing but sin theta so the vertical component of uh, this p you can see here it is nothing but vertical component of p vertical component of p and this is again the variation of displacement here the time integral is there but at any time instant at the boundaries the condition have to be satisfied so these are satisfied at any time instant at two locations at x is equal to 0 and x is equal to l so after separating this we now get the differential equation as ei del 4 y by del x 4 plus m del square y by del t square minus p del square y by del x square minus f x t equal to 0 and boundary condition you can see that ei del square y by del x square into del by del x into del y equal and is value evaluated at the boundary is equal to 0 and then ei del square this gives this bending moment is 0 or slope is 0 at the boundaries x is equal to 0 or at x is equal to l so ei del square y by del x square equal to 0 or del y by del x equal to 0 so if i take a simply supported beam so this condition will take and if i take a fixed beam so this condition del y by del x equal to 0 has to be taken similarly from this uh, shear condition that shear term we got ei del cube y by del x cube minus p del y by del x into del y 
evaluated at the boundary 0 to L equal to 0. So, this equation gives you can see here the vertical shear is balanced by the vertical component of the axial force present. So, easily you can recognize that E i del cube y by del x cube equal to P into del y by del x. P del y by del x is nothing but vertical component of the axial force that I have shown here how the vertical component of the axial force is taken P into del y by del x. So, here the same thing is coming and you can see this shear is balanced by the vertical component of the axial force or deflection equal to 0. So, that two condition can be taken y is 0 when the beam is supported in any manner fixed simply supported or pin supported or any other support. So, y is taken as 0 if the vertical displacement is restrained at the support. Okay. So, let us take the case of a axially compressed bar and uh, we will take a simply supported case. So, free vibration problem is formulated and for axial compression P is taken as my with a negative sign and therefore, the equation becomes E i del 4 y by del x 4 plus m del square y by del t square plus P del square y by del x square equal to 0. So, here what change we have given because it is axially compressed beam. So, for compression compressive force P is to be replaced replaced by minus P. So, we get this equation. So, again for free vibration we assume that y x t is equal to phi x into sin omega t. So, after substituting this we now get E i d 4 phi by d x 4 minus m omega square phi plus p d square phi by d x square equal to 0 and dividing throughout by divide throughout by throughout by E i we get d to the power 4 phi by d x 4 minus m omega square by E i phi plus p by E i d square phi by d x square equal to 0. So, this equation need to be solved for finding the, the function phi and then after substituting the boundary condition we can find the transcendental equation. So, in reference uh, Karnovsky and Libet, his name of his book is Formulas for Structural Dynamics it is Magro Hill Publishers, New York. So, in this reference, the solution of phi is found out and here the x by L ratio is taken as j. So, the limit of the j is 0 to 1. Okay. So, the solution is found as C1 sin hyperbolic mj, C2 cos hyperbolic mj plus C3 sin nj plus C4 cos nj, where C1, C2, C3, C4 are constants of integration. Now, he has shown that m is equal to L into root over minus P by 2 ei plus again root over P by 2 ei whole square plus m by ei omega square and n is equal to L root over P by ei plus root over again P by 2 i whole square plus m by ei omega square. Okay. For simply supported beam, the boundary conditions are phi at 0 and 1 that is at the both ends is 0 and the second derivative at the both ends is 0 because the bending moment is 0 at the simply supported or pin pin beam. So, therefore, characteristic equation becomes sin n equal to 0. This gives n is equal to n pi where small n equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. So, capital N the expression was found earlier by the author as L root over P by 2 Ei plus root over 
p by 2 e i whole square plus m by e i omega n square equal to n pi. So, n varies from 1 to up to infinity. So, from this expression let us extract omega n that can be done after squaring and arranging in this fashion p by 2 e i plus root over p by 2 e i square plus m by e i omega n square equal to n square pi square by l square. Then uh, we get this uh, if I take this p by 2 e i here right hand side and again square it then we get p by 2 e i whole square plus m by e i omega n square equal to n square pi square by l square minus p by 2 e i whole square. So, m by e i omega n square can be now written as this can be again taken here and factorization can be done because it is in the form say s square minus b square. So, from that the factor the product of two uh, terms a plus b into a minus b can be taken and it can be simplified as m by e i omega n square this is the right hand side directly I have taken here and after transferring this here and factorizing we now get right hand side is equal to 1 minus p l square divided by n square pi square e i into n to the power 4 pi to the power 4 by l to the power 4. Now you can see here certain term is known to us. So we know that when a bar is actually compressed the Euler assumption gives the buckling load as n square pi square e i divided by l square at any number of at any modes. So, here the Euler critical load at the nth mode subscript n should be written here to nth mode it is this and the first mode the Euler critical load is pi square e i by e i pi square e i by l square ok. So, that is, that is what is observed here and therefore, it is written as 1 minus p by p e n n to the power 4 pi to the power 4 divided by l to the power 4. So, therefore, omega n we get omega n square is now 1 minus this and this is nothing but 1 by p e. p e is uh, you can also attach a subscript for denoting this as a nth mode. So, p n because n is associated here. So, here you can see it. Now, one thing is common to us or known to us say if I take the square root of that then omega n natural frequency is n square pi square and uh, l square l to the power 4 we have taken. So, root over e i by m l to the power 4 root over 1 minus p by p e n. So, you can see this is what is actually the natural frequency of natural frequency expression of simply supported beam of simply supported beam without axial force without axial force. So, that is obvious here. So, therefore, we can write omega n the natural frequency of the beam carrying an axial force will be omega n equal to omega s n root over 1 by p divided by p. This is the ratio of the axial load to the buckling load at the nth mode. So, you can see in absence of axial load the natural frequency is same as the natural frequency is simply supported beam or if the axial load is small compared to critical load then natural frequency is almost equal to the natural frequency of the simply supported beam without any axial load. However, the, the beam is designed not to attend a critical load because at this stage this instability will come. So, therefore, P by P e ratio is, is always 1. As you go in the higher modes, P by P e ratio will still be lower and lower 
and at the very uh, large number of modes uh, when the mode, mode number is very large you will find there is no difference between the natural frequency of the simply supported beam without axial load and with load. So the beam with the axial load is also have practical uh, application just like your pre-stress concrete beam where the axial thrust is there due to pre-stressing force and therefore natural frequency of such beam is influenced by your pre-stressing force or axial compression. Now here let us give an example, take a simply supported beam of length 1.5 meter, mass 4 kg per meter and EI is equal to 10 to the power 3 Newton per meter square and uniformly compressed by 2000 Newton load. First three natural frequencies are found, we first find the uh, this buckling load at different modes. So P E1 is 4386 Newton and this ratio is 0 0.455. P by P E1 is 0 0.455. In mode 2, Euler critical load is P E2 is 17544, 17544 Newton and P by P E2 ratio is 0 0.114. Similarly, in the mode 3, P3 ratio is 9 pi square into 10 to the power 3 divided by 1.5 square equal to 39474 Newton equal to P by P3 equal to 0.050. So, using this formula that we have derived now, we can find that uh, this factor EI by ML to the power 4 root over is 7.027. So natural frequencies of the simply supported beam when axial force is 0 this value is 69.36, 277.4 and 620.4.2. These are angular frequencies so uh, unit is radian per second. But when axial force are present and we have found at each mode the ratio of P by P then the natural frequencies are 61.76. 275.59 and 623 radian per second. You can observe from these two results as number of mode increases, the effect of axial force on the natural frequency reduces. Okay. Now let us uh, talk about the infinite beam subjected to free vibration. So we take a inf beam of infinite domain, the boundaries are not prescribed and we take uh, equation undamped equation of free vibration. So EI del 4 Y by del X 4 into M del square Y by del T square equal to 0. Dividing by EI and taking S square equal to EI by M, we can write del to the power 4 Y by del X to the power 4 plus 1 by S square del square Y by del T square equal to 0. And the initial condition we have assumed that y x 0 is equal to f x and the velocity del y del x 0 by del t equal to a d square d g x by d x square. So these are the initial conditions we have taken. We will use the Fourier transform technique because in such beam boundary conditions cannot be prescribed. So there is no existence of normal modes and we cannot uh, apply the mode supervision technique. So let us assume that Fourier transform exists and the derivatives of the displacement and its derivatives up to third order because third order is giving the shear force are 0 at the infinite x domain. So which permits us to use complex Fourier transform. So Fourier transform of the displacement function yxt is defined as capital Y pt equal to integration minus infinity to plus infinity yxt e to the power i px dx. You can see here it is a complex number. So it is a complex Fourier transform having real part as well as imaginary part. And it is now from x domain now it is converted to p domain and t is there. x t domain was there and it is now converted to small p and t domain. Inverse Fourier transform accordingly is defined as y x t 
equal to 1 by 2 pi integration minus infinity to plus infinity y bar p comma t e to the power minus i p x d p. Now here the function is again converted to a function of y p t which was function of p is now converted to a function of x. So therefore the integration was carried out with respect to p. So similarly here the function is transformed to a function of p. So therefore integration is converted or integration is performed with respect to x. Uh, the transform of the fourth power of the equation, fourth power we have got because the uh, the elastic term that is ei del 4 y by del x 4. So therefore we need this Fourier transform of this. So Fourier transform of this can be easily verified because uh, if I exchange the operator then here p to the power 4 term will come because after 4 derivative it will be plus i square remembering i square is equal to minus 1. So the y bar to the power 4 that is the 4th derivative it is not actually power it is the 4th derivative bracket pt equal to p to the power 4 y bar pt. Therefore differential equation of motion is transformed in this way. Now from ordinary uh, fourth order differential equation of partial nature partial differential equation now it is converted to second order differential equation and you can see d square y bar pt by dt square this is due to this inertia term where the second derivative was involved and then s square p to the power 4 y bar pt equal to 0. This second order differential equation can be solved and found uh, and the response y bar can be found provided the initial conditions are known, transformed initial conditions are known. So transform initial conditions are y bar pt is equal to fp, let us take it fp and fp is nothing but minus infinity plus infinity y x naught e to the power i p x d x equal to minus infinity to plus infinity f x d x because this is the initial condition. Initial condition does not because time index is not involved because the t is substituted 0. So therefore the only function that is with the variable x. Similarly the, the initial condition for velocity transform initial condition can be taken as d y bar p t by d t at t is equal to 0 is nothing but integration minus infinity to plus infinity del y x comma 0 by del t into e to the power i p x into d x equal to a that means this uh, function is Fourier transform. So with the help of Fourier transform it is coming as a and substituting this whatever we got earlier is integration of minus infinity to plus infinity d square g by dx square into e to the power i p x and uh, you can see this after interchanging the operator we get minus a p square integration minus infinity to plus infinity g x e to the power i p x dx and it is nothing but a p square into g bar capital G bar p. So these are two initial uh, condition that is transformed in this domain. So one is f p and another is s square p g bar p. Okay. Now with this initial conditions and this we proceed to find the solution. Solution of this is nothing but we know this type of equations give the solution as this uh, cosine function and sine function both are involved. So the cos a p square t that is one term and constant of integration is nothing but here function of p. Then another is constant of integration defined constant c to p as a function of p into sine a p square t. So at t is equal to 0 if I want to evaluate 
using the transform condition we know c1 p is f, f bar and c2 p is minus g p. So, putting t is equal to 0 here we now get this condition as c1 p is equal to f bar p and c2 p is equal to minus g bar p. So, therefore, solution can be written as y bar p f p cos f p square t minus g bar p sin f p square t, but this is the transformed response. Transformed response. We have to again convert this or transform back to the original response. So, taking inverse transform, so physical domain can be found out. So, y x t equal to 1 by 2 pi uh, this physical domain here I mean the time domain response is found out integration minus infinity to infinity y bar p t e to the power minus i p x d p. So, this solution is known to us. So, it has two parts with cos uh, cosine function and sine function. Cosine functions are involving the initial condition for displacement and sine function was involving the initial condition for the velocity. So, here the integration is evaluated in the two parts 1 by 2 pi integration minus infinity to plus infinity f prime f bar p cos a p square t e to the power minus i p x d p minus 1 by 2 pi integration minus infinity to plus infinity g bar p sin a p square t e to the power minus i p x d p. So, given the form of initial displacement and velocity, the integration can be evaluated and the response quantity at any section x at any time instant t can also be found out. Okay. So, let us summarize today's lecture. So, in this lecture we have discussed the vibration of beam resting on elastic foundation. Then we have taken up a problem of a prismatic beam or bar carrying an axial force and we have investigated the effect of axial force on the natural frequency. So, first we have derived the equation of motion uh, using the Hamilton principle and then we have discussed how the natural frequency expression can be found out for a simply supported beam and we have seen that it is nothing but the natural frequency of the simply supported beam into some factor and that factor is nothing but again root over 1 minus p by p where p by p is the ratio of the axial load to the Euler buckling load for the beam subjected to axial force. So, this problem we have solved and uh, in relation to a simply supported beam with some numerical data, we have examined how the natural frequencies are changing. Now, we have seen as the number of modes are increasing, the effect of axial force become negligible. Then we have found the free vibration of infinitely long beam and that was discussed with the help of Fourier transform technique. Since in such cases, the normal modes does not come into the picture. So, Fourier transform technique was the only method that can be used for such kind of problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.